I've been watching cycling since I was a kid. And at that time, all sport across the board seemed to be pretty monoracial. So if you watch tennis, if I watch tennis, and I watch even track and field, for example, except for the sprints, it all seemed like pretty monoracial. And then over time, I, I started seeing, you know, other demographics getting into like football, into tennis, into Formula One, golf, that sort of thing. <clears throat> but the sport that I loved the most was cycling, and I just kind of expected more people to turn up, and it didn't happen. It's just, and so sometime in my late 30s, I had this idea that Kenyans were winning marathons everywhere in the world. They ought to be really good if you gave them a bike. I waited for the Singapore Marathon, and uh, I looked for the winners, and I said, I'll just follow you back to Kenya. But I bought a ticket from Singapore to Nairobi. There was only one flight that night, and I gambled that uh, the Kenyans who run the marathon the morning on, on the same day will be on the flight on the same evening. So when I reached the airport, I saw these light skinny black guys, and I, I thought, okay, those are the marathon runners for sure. So I looked for the winner, and I, I, I said, I'm following you home. Then he took a matatu to Eldoret, and I followed him in the matatu. And I was sitting next to the Olympic uh, champion in 1992, the Barcelona Olympic champion, 3,000 meter steeplechase. I was sitting next to him for like six hours in the Matatu. A guy called Matthew Bure. So that's how the whole project started. When you think about global excellence, when you think, you know, what are the best things in the world, you think maybe like Apple computers, you think Harvard University, Cambridge, you think um, maybe Mercedes-Benz, you think things like that. And you never associate any of that stuff with Africa. But when I step out of my door in the morning and attend, I think this is like the Harvard and the Cambridge and the Apple computers of distance running. Like there's no level above this. <clears throat> you know, my landlady, for example, she goes off and she says, I'm going off to win a race. And it's against her, the best runners, like the rest of the world have to offer them. And she comes back to it and you say, how do you do? Oh, well, I, I won. <laughs> I'm the world champion right now. So that happens all the time. So I've learned that I can come here and really be inspired. Well, Kenya has fluctuated in different sports over the years. Uh, athletics is the, the one sport that has kind of run through the generations uh, for the last 30, 40, 50 years. There is a tremendous understanding now in the Aten area of athletics and the Eldoret area, uh, so that we now even have functions and marathons uh, organized in the area and road races. And people now begin to see all the benefits that have accrued from the success in athletics. Nicholas, he's bringing in a sport that is, in a sense, new to the area. But, in a sense, he can learn from how the athletics developed. Whatever, you, whatever sport you come in on, you must build on what you've got. Not what you would like to have, and not what you think you have. For me, the kids ran barefoot walked long distances, ran to school. I kind of took all these little ideas and brought them all together to make successful athletes. The bicycle's actually part of Kenyan culture. The bicycle of Kenya is actually the Black Mamba. It's this traditional English roadster. All the parts of are available here, everything is the most ubiquitous bike, so we want to base our program on that. I was in Eldoret, there's a climb out of it, and I found all these border border riders, so I would like pay them 20 shillings, and I sit at the back of it, and I get them to like, ride to the top of that climb. 
and I timed them all, and the fastest guy was Moingi. <laughs> so I said, dude, you're really strong. Why don't you try cycling? <laughs> yeah, he came, and then he told me, I want you to carry me on your border border. And then, so he told me, I want you to take me up to that club and then down. And then I said, OK. That was a tough day. <laughs> it was like a multi-pronged approach to find cyclists, and that was one of them. Most of them used the bicycle to make a living in some form or another. So Jiroge, he used to be a milk carrier, and he carried up to like 50 kilos of milk on his, on his black mamba, and he cycled up to 30, 40 kilometers a day. Eureka was a tradesman. So everybody in the first generation were people who, who used the bicycle to either move themselves around or as a form of transportation. So it's not, it's not as if we're getting a guy to do cross-country skiing, for example. It's not one of these things. It's actually a part of their culture. But what is not part of their culture is the fact that it's, it, it can be a sport. We've been doing the Tour of Rwanda on and off the past couple of years. Cost-wise, it's not too far away. We can get a bus there, even though it's a long trip. But um, yeah, it's not going to cost us a lot of money to get to the race, which is good. Yeah, coming through the Rwandan border was fine, but now we're heading off to customs. And last time I had to go to customs, it took me almost a whole day to get the bike. So, Here see is. what happens. Test the patience. Tour of Rwanda, we think it's the best race in all of Africa. It's super competitive now. Uh, it has built up a good name. The overseas teams, all the best teams in Africa. So it is going to be a very competitive race. Uh, I think all the teams that were there last year will be stronger than they were last year. So we're definitely going to be up against it. Yeah a bit of national flag of Kenya. I think it is good. Uh, I'm excited to be here, but a little bit nervous. Mm, you don't know the competition. But uh, we trust ourselves. I trust myself. So I can only do what I can do. I can't do more. I haven't found the, my lucky number yet. Hope to find it soon. It doesn't rain often enough in Kenya when we're training, but we do try and replicate sort of slippery stuff, encourage skidding and all that. But I would prefer if it was dry. <laughs> We have this like root and branch rethinking about what um, an African team, a cycling team should be. And a lot of this is based on the way in which people are successful with running. So uh, one of the things that you realize is that a Kenyan has a very, very deep and organic relationship with the earth, which is the reason why he runs so well. He falls in it very well. He uses it as an apparatus. And the better his relationship with the earth is, the faster he moves and the, the more earth he moves beneath him. We need to build that kind of relationship with technology. Bicycles are essentially a, a kind of technology. So the, the work that we do with them is very, very deliberate. Find your rhythm first. Windy, you're going to get pushed around. So find your rhythm, build into it, and then go fast. <laughs> We feel that the guys' relationship to the bicycle and their bike handling skills were quite poor. 
that they used to fall off their bikes often, they were not good on descents. And so that was one way of like, right, how can we get the boys comfortable on bicycles? Doing it at high speeds, dropping down a hill uh, on a road bike on tarmac, it sort of doesn't allow for that relaxation, that playfulness to come out. Because if you do make a mistake, that can be extremely painful. So we thought, well, how, what other tools can we use to get the relationship, just the playfulness and more one with the machine? You know, a pump track, BMX track, it's heaps of fun. It doesn't feel like training, it's a lot like being a kid again. And yes, you don't need to be able to jump on a road bike, you don't need to be able to rail the berm on a road bike or even pump terrain. But it's just building that relationship that for myself and most other Aussies and Americans, Europeans, I'm sure I got my first bike before I was five years of age. And me and my brother and the mate across the road be doing jumps, building jumps, doing skids, daring each other to go off something. And yes, I hurt myself, I fell off, I crashed a lot, but I also learned all those little things that you don't think about when you're riding a bike. Whereas a lot of Kenyans don't get a bike until they're 18, 19, 20. So they've lost those 15, 10 years of being silly on a bike to build that relationship and be comfortable, be smooth, pedal in circles. And I think the pump tracks work quite well. We have this whole bunch of coaches on board who actually come from a running background. They don't come from a cycling background because what's relevant here is, you know, what makes the, the runner successful. So if you ask me, I'm a lot more interested in the life of David Rodisha, for example, or Wilson Kipsang than I am in the life of Bradley Wiggins and Lance Armstrong because the things that Bradley has and the things that Lance have the, and the resources that, that were made available to them are just things that we don't have. No way it's been done before. So we get to an obstacle and we've got to try and think, all right, what is the best way around this, through it, over it, how can we solve it? And then move on, not get so carried away in the, I've got to have this equipment, I've got to have this for my training, I've got to have this. But it's like, unless you import every single thing, you can't have it. So what can we work with here in Kenya? What resources do we have? Can they make strong people? Because really that's all you're doing is making someone strong on a bike. So when a problem faces you, you're not going to solve it straight away. Like just African timeout and just sort of, you know, you'll solve it eventually. Try and think of a creative way of doing it. When the coach came, he introduced the morning session to make us stronger in the middle part of the body and to make us to make sure that the body is not moving so much on the saddle. It's not about fitness, it's about how you take your body to the bike. really comes down to your relationship with, with the athletes um, that you're working with and if it's a good relationship and you've got to work hard for that and you have to earn respect and then the athletes are prepared to do things that um, maybe not in mainstream coaching for running or cycling you know they believe in you you know you have a bit of a vision they see that you have a bit of a vision and they're prepared to uh, you know veer off the, the trodden path with you so the first challenge was to develop a relationship and then to identify the objective. And that was to eventually lift these guys to world-class level in cycling. For cycling, if you have to, to be successful, first you have to find the team spirit first. So the coach came with other ideas and uh, how we can work as a team and uh, get results as a team at the same time. If we can get a result as a team, then there's a, there's a chance that we can have individual success, but first we have to find that rhythm for the team. According to the, to the competition now, if we can have two or three people on the top ten, maybe even one stage win, and I think team top four, I think it will be a successful tour. The 
the tour of Rwanda, the journalist or whoever comes here in the tour of Rwanda, they see the whole country, nothing is hidden. And that's just the whole joy of cycling. All the cities, all the people, and you can really get a, a vibe of the country because you're not in a hotel in the capital, you're not at a conference, you're in the country and you see the enthusiasm of the spectators. That's not something you can make up. And I think every African country could do the same thing if they really invested in it. People are putting effort in more than, you know, what they, they would ever earn. And those are the people that drive African cycling. It's just, uh, you know, all, all sports, Africans are leading. And this is the only sport where it's not happening. And we're trying to change that. When you go to a race, you expect much things to happen. If you have a puncher, maybe you can get back the, the, the peloton. If you crash, then you lose some little time. You, can, you have to expect something. It's amazing how things can change pretty quickly. So like physically even such a small, small thing can cost you enormous amounts of minutes and then someone out of a race as well. You get frustrated so much <laughs> because there are sometimes things they went the wrong way that you, you didn't expect them to do. Well, everything was just going according to plan. Then there is a call from the, from the commissar's car that Kenya has a mechanical and then we finally get up there Nixon gets out, takes a while to fix, fixes it. Mungi's dropped back to assist Arico. By the time they get going, they're quite a way off the peloton. As they're getting close to getting back, then Arico runs out of energy, pops, and uh, Mwangi fights alone to get back. Like that day, I did not expect Arico to bug like that. When we were nearly to the, to the group, then he dropped. And then it gets a puncher on the way, and there was no neutral surface car, there was no broom wagon, we don't know where they were. And uh, so he ended up riding his bike with the puncher for most of the way, but on all the uphills had to walk. And by the time he got to the finish line, he'd missed the, the percentage cut and um, was cut from the tour. So I went and spoke to the commissar that night from the UCI and they just said it's just the way it is. Definitely weakened the team, brought us down to a five-man team and uh, that was the end of the tour for Rico and I think he was in good shape. For, for sure, this year I was working very hard but uh, I, I was focused for this race, Tour of Rwanda. But for that, that stage, he <laughs> spoiled everything. And, uh, but luckily, the rest of the team pulled the positives out of it and, uh, you know, just yeah, told everyone to look forward. It was still, it's a long way to go. Um, and then Paddy and Nixon just banged straight into their work, do an amazing job. Yeah, there are always going to be lows and uh, you hope for a few highs. And so you have to be philosophical about it. And I guess the longer you coach, <laughs> the more you can just ride with the, the roller coaster. The best thing is, they're having no trouble staying with the peloton and sometimes they're finishing right up the very front of that peloton. So that's, that's wonderful, the potential is there. The future of cycling in the world lies within Africa. Something away from all the problems that we're seeing at the moment. You know, it's away from the Lance Armstrong that, you know, 
that, that killed the sport. And this is a true story. These are real people that, you know, come from nothing and really don't have anything. One of the biggest challenges here in Africa is the amount of racing and hard racing. Uh, like all of us, whether Rwandan, Kenyan, we need more racing. I mean, these guys can excel incredibly well if they were given more races like this. I mean, if we had a race like this, you know, in the spring, you know, three or four like this, tour of Kenya, tour of Uganda, and then go to maybe a European race, it would just be incredible. So uh, coming into today's stage, Drogi was fourth, the team was fourth, and we would have been very happy just to hold on to onto that position for both the GC and the teams. And then, uh, yeah, Drogi's pulled out of the bag and come home and got a third place on the line. No, I didn't expect to get a podium finish in the GC. We uh, and our whole objective was for the team, strong team, and, and we're very happy with the fourth place because we know the guys in front of us were yeah they're strong. I'm so happy. I've got no, no problem. I'm so happy. <laughs> it is the first tour of one we finished. Uh, last year before the race got started, he got hit by a car. And uh, the year before that, I think he crashed out as a pretty junior, young sort of cyclist. We didn't really know what he was doing in the first tour two years ago. But uh, yeah, the guy's learning. He's becoming very, very strong. And uh, yeah, he gets third place. Not too bad. You know, the Kenyan riders definitely have not even sounded the depths of their talent there, as, you know, us also. It's just a matter of patience and getting the right people to work with. In Kenya, there's also, there is a, a very good cycling people. They are very young guys who can be very strong, but to get them, it's very hard because they don't know what to cycle, but they are there, they are very strong, they can be very good in cycling, but yeah, but I know if they can see me in newspaper or somewhere else, and then we see and tell them, do this and this, I think it can be more better. Because yes, we've had this team, uh, sort of the point of the arrow, the elite guys in a way you could say. But then we feel for Kenya to be successful, we've got to have enormous numbers. We've got to have more people riding bikes. Can we get interest uh, in different parts of Kenya around so that we've just got more options and more talent to choose from? That's another one of the reasons why Kenyan runners are so good, is just there's so many people running that you don't have to do much else. If there's that many people running at a high level, you're going to get talent popping up everywhere and you don't have to work that hard to find it. We're starting to realise that, you know, it's probably going to be another generation or two younger guys that'll come through that are going to do the impressive things. I think Kenyan cycling has a lot of potential, but it's just a matter of time before we go to the biggest level yet. I want Kenyan rider to grow uh, as a unit. Yeah, and I want cyclists to come from Kenya who are strong. I want so many things, but yeah, I want Kenyan riders to grow, the project to grow. To lift Kenyan cycling somewhere in this world that we can have a name in the world that Kenyan Cycling, cycling Federation has people who have potential to, to do something, maybe to partic participate one day in the Tour de France. Like, like we do in athletes, in running. We want to have a name in cycling like that.
and I see that the Kenyan run is actually an integral part of the running industry. If you want your marathon to be world class, you want an IAAF gold label race, you have to invite Kenyans and Ethiopians, you know, so they become equal partners, not just equal partners, but like really important people. And so Africa is going to be that in the next couple of decades, and we're just pioneers in that in a pioneering sport.